Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, the coronavirus on a global march. Is Canada ready? We need to shift our thinking. From your doctor's office to local hospitals, what's the plan? Plus, your questions answered. Impeccable hand hygiene is key. Also tonight, we're invited inside Wet'suwet'en territory. What the pipeline means for the people who live there. And tracing the mystery behind the painting. Whomever it's by, it's a really stunning portrait. Crowdsourcing for theories to explain her story. This is The National. The new coronavirus may have started in China, but now more than ever, COVID-19 has gone global. Yeah, for the first time, there are more new cases outside China than inside. COVID-19 is on every continent except for Antarctica. Now, fears are focused now on South Korea, where 100 new cases emerged overnight, on Italy, where the virus has infected hundreds and prompted a lockdown, and on Iran which reported its first case exactly one week ago, but within days had the highest death toll outside China. What's more, these hotspots are now linked to new cases in more than a dozen countries, including our own. Officials say a recent traveler to Iran has become Canada's 12th case. And so governments across the globe all face the same question. Are we prepared? Catherine Cullen is in Ottawa, where a top public health official laid out Canada's plan. We're still in containment phase, but we have to start preparing. The message from health officials is a mix of reassurance and caution. We're also starting to prepare for a possible pandemic. So we can't, we can't do this with our eyes closed and not recognize what might happen weeks and months from now. Travelers who visited Hubei province in China still get extra screening. Others in airports are asked to speak up if they have any symptoms. But health officials say simply shuttering Canada to anyone isn't a solution. It's not about closing the borders. It's certainly uh, from, a, from a public health perspective, closing the borders has never proven to be effective in terms of stopping the sort of the spread or the introduction of disease into any country. Officials say the health care system is preparing too, including lessons learned from past outbreaks. Right now, we're doing 30 or 40 tests a day. Our lab can do up to 1,000. But we don't want to rest on that. Why do we have to go to two or 3,000? How are we going to prepare for that? So you got to do that preparation now. Even the armed forces, which has helped with repatriation flights and quarantines, says it's ready to do more. We are currently refreshing contingency plans for a larger domestic response. I think it's always wise to be prepared uh, from a community and a country level. The health minister said today Canadians can play a role as well by washing their hands, staying home if they're ill, and being ready the same way they would for a major snowstorm or power disruption. There's no magic to this. It's really about, first of all, uh, making sure that you do have enough supplies. If someone in your family becomes ill, if you yourself become ill, that you have what you need to survive, uh, you know, for a week or so without having, without going out. The goal is to reassure. Officials insist Canadians' risk of getting COVID-19 is low and that they are ready to respond if that changes. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, whatever impact COVID-19 ends up having in Canada, it will be hospitals and healthcare workers at the forefront. Vicka Dopia gives us a sense of how ready they are. So this is one of our supply rooms here, just to give you a sense. At Humber River Hospital, the shelves are packed with equipment in case of an outbreak. Ventilators, which are ready to go. We've got three of them in here. We have another one in one of the other rooms. We have our, our, our papper hood set up. It's like a whole helmet that's attached to a HEPA filter around their back if we needed them. Humber River was designed with isolation rooms, as are most new hospitals in Canada. Entire wings can be quarantined. Still, it doesn't take much to overwhelm any hospital and its existing patients. If we had any increase in surge, we would have to put those people either in unusual places or we would have to try to stop as many elective procedures as we possibly could. Screening is now focusing on a widening circle of countries. We need to shift our thinking into this is going to become a problem within Canada within a matter of weeks to months and so we need to get on that. We can't just keep pretending we're going to screen everybody out at the, uh, at the airport. Family practices aren't as well stocked as hospitals and there's not much this doctor says she can do. I don't know, check the mail for more gloves, hopefully, but we don't have those or more hand sanitizer. She hasn't seen the coronavirus, but it's still keeping her busy. 
questions around how likely a person is to get it, and is it soon coming to Canada, and will their families be affected, and how many hospitalizations, and is it safe to go to an emergency room, and is it safe to travel? So far, only Ontario and B.C. have seen confirmed cases. Other provinces are also preparing themselves. But just how big the disruption could be is still unknown in an outbreak that's only getting worse. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Canada's two most recent cases are connected to Iran, where there are fears the outbreak is far worse than officials are admitting. Iran is reporting 19 deaths from coronavirus, the highest number outside of China, but just 139 cases. Now, that number just doesn't add up for a virus with about a 2% fatality rate. Logically, there should be hundreds more cases. Tina Lovegreen spoke to families who are worried about loved ones in Iran. When I see the picture, uh, I just remember that uh, memorable day. Neda Salimian reflects on a happier moment when her whole family was together. It's, it's too hard for me to continue. Her husband, who's a permanent resident, is stuck in Iran with no way to get back to Canada. She and their teenage son are frightened. He's missing uh, his dad uh, a lot. He feels alone. Hello. As the coronavirus spreads, neighboring countries have shut down their borders and flights out of Iran are almost impossible to come by. All of uh, international airlines uh, are stopped. Uh, it was like uh, two months in advance. It's a situation many Canadian Iranians are finding themselves in. Golsa Saadi's father was supposed to visit for the upcoming Persian New Year, but his Turkish Airlines flight is also cancelled. It's so hard. Every day I wake up and just the first thing that I do is checking the news. More people have died from the coronavirus in Iran than any other country outside of China. There are doubts the country is equipped to contain the virus and fears it's vastly underreporting the number of cases. Travel agencies are scrambling to help passengers. The only real option is Qatar Airways. Yesterday we found just one seat for 4,200. How much is it usually? 2,000 or less. Salimian and others are asking the government to help. They sent an airplane uh, to take them to Canada. But the government says it won't do that, leaving many loved ones separated for the time being. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, North Vancouver. Iran's president downplayed the danger and blamed Western media for fanning the flames of panic. The U.S. president has had a similar message. Paul Hunter shows us how Donald Trump was keen tonight to show his administration not the coronavirus is in control. Said to have been privately frustrated by U.S. efforts to stop the spread of the virus, Donald Trump publicly tonight played down its impact on America so far. Because of all we've done, the risk to the American people remains very low. Underlining the still tiny number of people infected in this country, Trump nonetheless signaled he's willing to go beyond what he'd expected in response to it. We were asking for $2.5 billion, and we think that's uh, a lot. But uh, the Democrats and, I guess, uh, Senator Schumer wants us to have much more than that. And normally in life, I'd say, we'll take it. We'll take it. This after a tweet earlier in which Trump suggested news reports are doing everything possible to make the coronavirus look as bad as possible, including panicking markets. Meanwhile, critics had slammed Trump for having made deep budget cuts during his time in office to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, said Democrats earlier on Trump's response broadly to the growing worldwide threat. I don't think the president knows what he's talking about once again. Tonight, Trump put Vice President Mike Pence in charge of coordinating Thank U.S. action on the virus, and as for those cuts Trump's made to the CDC, said Trump, he's unworried. Whichever infectious disease experts were let go can always be rehired. I don't like having thousands of people around when you don't need them. When we need them, we can get them back very quickly. Trump did note there's a chance this could all get worse here, but nothing's inevitable, he said. Adding that wherever this does go, the U.S. is, as Trump put it tonight, very, very ready. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Northern Italy is the heart of a coronavirus outbreak that has Europe on edge. 
Buongiorno. Every day is a very, very full this place. But now, no, it's a very big problem for the economy of Italy because the Milan is a capital of business. Empty piazzas, idle businesses. See how an explosion of cases has triggered an implosion of confidence. That's later in the program. There is now just one blockade stopping rail traffic in this country, and trucks have started moving into the port of Vancouver. That is the word late today from the transportation minister. But anger and defiance, will they continue? More than 100 protesters stopped traffic at Winnipeg's famous Portage and Main intersection in support of some hereditary chiefs in BC who say their land rights are being trampled to clear the way for a natural gas pipeline. A statue at the RCMP headquarters was vandalized, as was the office of a Liberal MP. So on the one hand, the rail system is slowly grinding back to life, but the unrest has not been extinguished, and it flared up again today on a familiar stretch of highway. Ashley Berg shows us where things stand. The train's not stopping. The train's not stopping. Civil disobedience or outright lawlessness. A video online posted by Mohawk demonstrators shows them throwing tires and debris onto the tracks and setting them on fire. Oh, this was an extremely reckless act. Canada's transport minister says if there had have been dangerous goods on that train, there could have been a devastating explosion. Something that not only put in, in danger the life of the people who were actually lighting this fire under a moving train, but also could have been very dangerous for many other people. But for all the outrage, the government today fell back on a familiar plea. I would again continue to urge people to, to take the barricades down, to obey the law. Restore the rule of law and let people get back to work. But at the last remaining blockade, protesters aren't listening. Instead, they're digging in, reinforcing their barricade in case police move in to enforce a court injunction. It's up to the SQ to, to decide if they want to have a physical confrontation or not. We've been here for a couple of weeks now, and, and uh, you know, it's a peaceful demonstration. So uh, it would be better if they don't come in at all. The police, they have to dismantle the barricades, but they have to be careful because we have some information about the fact that there are some uh, offensive uh, guns that are on the reserve. Quebec's premier's claim that there may be AK-47s there isn't sitting well with the Mohawk police force. Uh, but to say these kind of things is it's irresponsible, it's dangerous, and it could, it's only going to exacerbate the situation. Even after today's tense scenes, the government says that it wants to resolve this dispute through dialogue. Meanwhile, CN is getting its operations back online, but after so much disruption, it could take weeks to clear the backlog. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. We have some breaking news that we want to get to right now. Dan Burrett standing by in our Vancouver newsroom. Dan, over to you. Andrew, a meeting between Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs opposing the natural gas pipeline in northern B.C. and federal and provincial governments that was cancelled earlier this evening is now back on. Hereditary chief Namux tells CBC News they received an update tonight that government officials plan to meet them tomorrow afternoon. He says they were told that word the meeting had been scrapped was due to a miscommunication. He now says two days of meetings to the rights and title of the Wet'suwet'en will be held in their office in Smithers. In a statement tonight, B.C. Premier John Horgan's office says, quote, this sounds promising, but they will officially confirm in the morning. There have been calls for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to meet with the hereditary chiefs as well. We'll be following this throughout the night and into the morning on all our CBC platforms. Back to you in Toronto now. Across the country, protesters have said they're acting in support of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. But some of those chiefs support the pipeline, as do many people who live on that territory. So, we've traveled to ground zero of this national controversy. Chris O'Neill Yates spent the day in Witset, the largest of the First Nations on that Wet'suwet'en land. And this is what she found. We have um, 700 people that live on reserve. The deep rift over the coastal gas link pipeline hits close to home for Lucy Gagnon, executive director of the Witsit First Nation. Her band voted for the pipeline, but her husband is a hereditary chief. My husband is anti-pipeline, and I work for a community as the executive director who have signed on, and they've signed an agreement with Coastal Gas Link. And so um, we've agreed in my house that we just don't talk about it. 
because um, I don't want it to affect our relationship. That seems to be the case for the wider community. We can't consume all our time talking about it. There's enough people out there talking about it. What kind of pipe is this? Black pipe, right? Black At this technical pipe. college, students are training for pipe fitting jobs. This course gives people the foot in the door to, you know, go on to do stuff like that and it can bring them a long ways. But even here, talk of the pipeline is avoided. There's lots of drama going on and I don't want to upset anybody by saying something wrong. Yeah. I'm Skaski Sait Denise Medik. Students here are learning the Wet'suwet'en language, which has almost disappeared. Despite the national controversy, they find getting on with normal life is the best way to cope. I'm not for, or am I against? I just, we need our rights as Indigenous people. People get nasty on both sides, and that shouldn't be, that's not us, and that's what this has created, and it's sad. Chief Victor Jim says these divisions will take time to heal, but only the Wet'suwet'en themselves can do that. We're working for the same people, and that's what we have to keep in the back of our minds. Even if right now the path ahead seems far from clear. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, on Witsit First Nation, BC. Now the kind of support for resource development you saw there in Witsit is mirrored in other First Nations communities across Canada. Today, leaders from many of those met together to discuss the best way forward for them. Aaron Collins shows us why. Traditional regalia. And the Blackfoot language on full display in this Calgary Convention Center. This room full of First Nations leaders looking for ways to use natural resources to lift their communities out of poverty. The press really goes after what the environmentalists want, but you know, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of First Nations that are very active and invested heavily in the oil and gas sector, the natural resource sector. People here believe they are the silent majority, convinced that resource development and protecting the environment can go hand in hand for Canada's First Nations. Who better to be partners with than people that have been taking care of the lands for thousands of years? For Alberta's Premier, this group a clear foil to the diverse collection of protesters who oppose new energy projects. A small number of urban green left militants purporting to speak for First Nations, but I believe more and more they are misappropriating the voice and the cause of Indigenous people. Alberta has established a billion dollar agency to help the province's First Nations invest in energy projects. It's also created a fund to help bands challenge federal laws they believe stand in their way. First up, Alberta's Woodland Cree First Nations constitutional challenge of what liberal critics call the No More Pipelines Act. My elders, they say, get her done, son. So we'll find a way. But these days, having the will to develop resource projects doesn't guarantee there's a way. As tensions intensify between the energy industry and green activists, well, First Nations that are trying to walk the line between those two camps can struggle to find a way forward. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. The Alberta government tables its budget tomorrow. And while investment in energy projects is expected to be a feature, as Rafi Bujikanyan found out, the possibility of health care cuts are top of mind for many. Supervised injection sites. Just one public service some Albertans are worried could get the axe in tomorrow's budget. After a wage freeze last fall, nurses worry about more cuts. We already have huge issues with overcapacity, meaning we don't have enough capacity in our system to deal with the patients who, who need uh, services. And doctors are already outraged that the government removed their ability for them to charge more for long patient visits. There continues to be heavy lifting. The finance minister today showed off the same uh, worn boots he did last budget. We were very uh, clear in Budget 2019 that there would be a reduction in the size of, of the public service. But the government may be looking to invest elsewhere, taking inspiration from the past. A strong oil and gas industry is essential. In the 1970s, Alberta created a public company to develop its energy sector, something the province says it is considering again. But that comes with warnings from analysts. There's a lot of investors that have lost, losing a lot of money 
in terms of their um, shirts, in terms of oil companies. So what's happening is, is are we going to be buying those companies? The Premier, though, is defiant. If we do not continue to develop those resources and sell them to global markets, then we cannot afford to pay for the world's, some of the world's best health care. The province hasn't ruled out investing in Tech's Frontier Mine project, even though the company has suspended its application for the oil sand site. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Edmonton. Millions of Canadians from Ontario to Newfoundland are in the path of a major winter storm tonight. Next, we'll break down what to expect and when. Are you looking for a place to live right now? Yes. A plan to find homes for Canada's homeless, and it's working in Edmonton. We got a home now. I don't have to come here anymore. It's a really stunning portrait. But who she is and who painted her, well, those are big mysteries. Any ideas? We're back in two minutes. I got my snowboards ready. Both of them. <laughs> Millions of Canadians are bracing for the biggest snowstorm of the season. Ottawa could see up to 40 centimeters of snow by Thursday. Toronto up to 25 centimeters, most of it falling tonight. If you could stay at home, that would be ideal. Stay off the roads, let our crews and our, our salt trucks and our equipment do their work. That message is being echoed by Environment Canada. It's got weather warnings, watches and statements stretching from southern Ontario to the Maritimes. A meteorologist Ryan Snodden is in Halifax tonight. Ryan, take us through it. What are we looking at here? Well, Andrew, this storm will be delivering snow and a ton of it from southern Ontario, which will be hardest hit tonight through Quebec, which will bear the brunt of the storm throughout Thursday to the Maritimes on Thursday afternoon before eventually moving into Newfoundland and Labrador on Friday. This storm is a slow mover that will be also bringing some Pretty gusty winds and blowing snow. The hardest hit areas where 25 to 40 centimeters of heavy snow looks likely includes major cities like Ottawa, Quebec City, and Fredericton. Even those areas that see a little bit less, like the Greater Toronto and Montreal areas, will still see a significant snowfall event of 10 to 25 centimeters by the time this one rolls out. Millions of people will be dealing with snowy and slick white knuckle driving conditions throughout the day on Thursday. Airport travel will very likely be impacted as well. In fact, tri travel advisories are already in place. Okay, and, and tell me a little bit more about some of those areas that could be hit by more bad weather starting tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, that's right. Round two. So uh, snow squalls, some very intense snow squalls will be setting up across southern Ontario uh, beginning Thursday afternoon and continuing right throughout the day on Friday. With snow squalls, again, they're isolated in terms of the areas they impact as narrow but very intense snow bands develop over the still open waters of the Great Lakes. However, the areas that do get hit will get hit hard. Places like Owen Sound, Collingwood, Barrie, Shelburne, Goderidge, are very likely going to need something much larger than a ruler to measure snowfall totals by Saturday morning, Andrew. More than 50 or 60 centimeters looking possible there. Yikes. Ryan, thanks very much. You're welcome. We're following a developing story in Milwaukee where five people were killed after a gunman opened fire. It happened at the Molson Coors Brewing Company campus. Employees were warned by email to find a safe place to hide. The suspect was described as a 51-year-old Milwaukee man. Police say he was found dead from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. This motive for this attack isn't known. Among the other stories we're watching across Canada tonight, at least one major retailer is severing ties with Canadian fashion mogul Peter Nygaard. U.S. department store chain Dillard says it will no longer sell Nygaard merchandise in its 300 outlets. The 77-year-old faces a sexual assault and trafficking lawsuit filed by 10 women. Nygaard has denied the allegations. He says he will step down as chairman of the Winnipeg-based company. Okay, so that shocking video posted last year has led to three charges being laid against a BC fisherman. The clip shows a group of sea lions scattering after a small explosive was thrown their way. At the time, the man in the video said he didn't want to hurt the animals. He just wanted them to move. Well, up next, your coronavirus questions answered. Plus. Journal.
Empty patios, piazzas, and hotel rooms. We will take you to a very deserted Italy right after the break. Give a big, warm Scottish welcome to Harry. Hmm, notice anything different to that introduction? Apparently he wants it that way. We'll explain a little later. Welcome back, and let's get back to our top story now, the COVID-19 virus and all of those new cases outside China. A sharp uptick in the number of cases in Europe shows that the virus has gained a foothold there, especially in Italy. Rene Filipponi is in Milan, where the effects are plain to see. Normally bustling with people all looking for the best picture. Today, the pigeons far outnumbered the tourists in this piazza. This American couple have been following coronavirus news and felt, for now, it was safe to come. We'll definitely keep an eye on it and um, just hoping for the best, having a fun vacation. Many don't see the fun. Guide Marta Ronconi has only booked one group all week. Usually, a tour guide work seven days on seven days. So just half day in a week is something quite uh, and unusual uh, and very dangerous. Ronconi believes Milan is safe and says the government may have gone too far by closing museums and schools here. Watching news, uh, it seems that uh, the end of the war that will be <laughs> tomorrow. But it does feel like some kind of apocalypse for the staff who stare at empty tables Buongiorno. and struggle to get customers. Every day is a very, very full this place. But now, no, it's a very big problem for the economy of Italy because the Milan is a capital of business. Today looks more like a weekend in the financial and fashion hub of Italy rather than rush hour on a Wednesday. This hotel manager says in just the past couple days, he's lost 60% of his business. Everybody is uh, canceling it now. This is crazy. It's so bad, he's asking staff to take vacation time and says the fear is moving faster than the virus. The cancellations are not only for uh, Milan area. Uh, they are spread uh, in Venice, uh, in Turin, in Rome, in Florence. Tourism makes up 13% of the Italian economy. And if the world keeps turning away, it could be devastating for a country already struggling financially. Rene Filipponi, CBC News, Milan, Italy. There are at least 44 countries now with confirmed cases, and Canadians are full of questions about the global spread of the virus. So we got some answers from an expert. My name is Isaac Bogosh, and I'm an infectious diseases physician and scientist based out of the Toronto General Hospital and the University of Toronto. Why are we starting to see a greater number of cases of COVID-19 outside of China? This is really reflective of a greater transmission of this infection in community settings. We know it can be transmitted from person to person. We're gradually redefining this as an epidemic into a pandemic as the virus continues to spread in multiple places around the world. How confident can we be with the data that we're receiving for COVID-19 around the world? Many countries are reporting on their COVID-19 cases, and it's important to recognize that not all data is created equally. We know that certain countries have a better capacity to collect and to report data than others, and we have to be skeptical of the data that we're seeing and that we're receiving. Having said that, when we look at data from multiple countries around the world, we can start to create a bigger picture of how this virus is spread and have a better understanding of its transmission dynamics, the clinical spectrum of illness, and how it's spreading from country to country around the world. What do we know about asymptomatic transmission of this infection? There's been a lot of talk about people who might have transmitted this infection to other people who didn't have any symptoms whatsoever. The true role of asymptomatic transmission is unknown. What we do know is that many people with this infection have very mild symptoms. And that's a bit concerning in one regard because people with mild symptoms may not seek medical care and these individuals may be transmitting the infection in the community. It can be daunting sitting on the precipice of a pandemic and thinking, you know, what can I do as an individual to protect myself and to protect my family or those around me? But there are things that people can do. Number one, to make sure you're up to date on all your vaccinations, have readily available prescriptions ready, and make sure that your chronic medical needs are tended to. Certainly, this is not influenza, but the same messaging really still applies because this is a respiratory virus. 
That means if you're sick, stay home from work, stay home from school so you don't infect other people. And lastly, we know this is a virus that can stick to surfaces. We're not sure how long it can stick to surfaces, but we certainly know it can stick to surfaces. So impeccable hand hygiene is key. Well, up next, tackling homelessness in this country. You're looking for a place to live right now? Yes. And this is a good place for you to start. You'll see and hear how a simple approach has turned out to be incredibly effective from the very people whose lives have been changed. And a little later, a mystery at the museum, and they want your help to solve it. Edmonton has set a bold goal for itself. It wants to eliminate chronic homelessness in less than two years. So far, the city has reduced homelessness by 43% over the past decade. Nick Purden shows us how this program works and who it's helped. How's it going? Not bad, how are you? I'm Trent. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Tim. Tim? Tim Argaropoulos. Uh, Tim Argaropoulos. Yeah. Are you uh, looking for housing right now? Yeah, I you... am actually. So when's the last time you had a, a place of your own? I don't know, about uh, 12 years ago, 15, 14 okay. years ago. This is Trent Adjakute. In a nutshell, it's his job to help homeless people in Edmonton find places to live. We just reach out to people. I'll oftentimes pass my car along and say, look, if you need housing, call this number. I'm going to give you this card, okay. right? So if you talk to them, they're going to assess you. You're going to have to do like a 15-minute interview with them just to see where you're at. Okay, great. All right? Sounds good. I Thanks. will go on and check it out. Thanks a lot, eh? Yeah, for sure. Take care. It's hard to believe, but there are 35,000 Canadians without a place to live. It's almost to the point where we seem to accept homelessness as a fact of life in cities. But in Alberta, they're putting up a fight. And here in Edmonton, they've made a remarkable promise to eliminate chronic homelessness in the next few years. Oh, Muppets. You remember this place? Hey. You know, I was fortunate enough to come around one day and uh, I just tried the door. And, you know, it opened, so. Ezra and his little dog used to live in this abandoned security shack. Ah, oh, man. Ezra hid their footprints so the security guards wouldn't see them. And he bought his own lock so he could keep his things inside during the day. Oh, my stuff's still in there. My cigarettes there. There's a bounty bar. There's cushions down in there. There's a jacket. You know, there's a thermostat there, there's a plug, and I was under that desk there. How long did you live in here? Uh, I was I was here for two months. Two months. In the winter? In the winter, yeah. Cold blowing by? Cold blowing by, coldest place on the planet. Me and Muffets. Yeah, her dishes are probably still in there. What's it like to look through the window now knowing oh, you have a place? Hard. Well, it's, oh, yeah, we got a home. We got a home now, you know, and uh, I don't have to come here anymore. It was when Ezra lived here, with no job, no income, struggling with addiction, that he got in touch with Edmonton's Housing First program and got an apartment. Just to be able to shovel your walk, you know? What does it do to have a place? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. Like, you can lock your door, you can keep your belongings, you know, you don't have to carry them on you. You know, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can cook. You know, you could, that's the biggest thing, like. When he was on the street, the one thing Ezra took care of the most was his dog. You know, different people have different things. You know, you carry, like, what you have, and, well, I had Muppet. What does she mean to you? Everything. You think you would have made it through without her? No, I probably would have fell, uh, uh, to be honest with you, I probably would have fell deep into addiction. But yeah, she kept me going. Hey, Mops, hey. Hey, buddy, hey, hey. So how did Ezra get to this point? Hey. How did he get from the streets into this apartment? So tell me why you'd come down here. It starts with this guy. Remember Trent, the outreach worker? You see, 
people just looking for help a lot, you know, like they really just need somebody to help them find a place to go, you know, or a place to stay, a home. Housing first is exactly what it says. It's about housing first. It's not putting any stipulations on somebody's housing. We don't require people to get sober to get housing. We just want to help people get off the street to get into safe places. That's surprising. You're homeless. They give you a place, even if you're struggling with addiction. Why does that make sense? We don't tell them how to live their lives because not everybody is in the same place, you know? Not everybody that lives in a house doesn't drink every day, you know? Like, maybe because they never experienced homelessness, that doesn't mean that, you know, they don't drink every day, they don't have a drinking problem, but they're able to maintain their housing. We're worried about helping people maintain housing. We're not here to judge their lifestyles. I've learned... In fact, there's only one demand they make of their clients. If you want to have a seat, we can just have a little chat. Sure that they take the first step and come here to the Homeward Trust offices, where the Housing First program is run. What's your name, sir? Uh, William Miller. William? I'm Trent. You're looking for a place to live right now? Yes. And this is a good place for you to start. It shows what vacancies we know about in the downtown area, and all around the city, actually, and how much the rent is and stuff. So, I mean, that's a good way for you to start. But What's really surprising is that most homeless clients get to pick their apartment from the open market. Did you We're not taking people and saying, okay, you're going to live here. They choose where they live. That's why we take them on multiple viewings. They get to choose the apartment they want to live in. If you get a chance... So if William chooses a few places he wants to look at, Trent would go with him to meet the landlord. William's rent would be subsidized for a year, and during that time, he'd have a caseworker to help him with the transition. As long as you keep checking in, you will get housed. I appreciate that. No worries. Thank you very much. Take care, man. I catch up with William by the elevator. William, what would it mean for you to get a place to live? Well, it would be absolutely life-changing. And it, like, I'm deteriorating so fast, it's unbelievable. It's a lot of violence. And um, it's crazy. So, and I'm, I'm too old for it. Like, I'm, I'm just not even the same human being as I was. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Even if you don't have compassion for William, and you wonder why we should help him. Thank you, guys. Trent says it's cost effective. We're saving lives, and we're saving the government money by doing this programming. Because then they're not spending the money on hospitals for people that end up there that are experiencing homelessness, or the justice system where people, you know, get incarcerated on purpose because they don't want to face, you know, minus 30 in the winter. Since 2009, Edmonton has housed 10,000 homeless people using the Housing First model. Come on, let's go. And Ezra's one of them. Get going. Go pee. And for the first time in a long time, he tells me he's excited about his future. You know, I keep my stairs off. Uh... Having an apartment has given me the means to, you know, have those dreams, have those hopes, have those aspirations. You know, like, when you're homeless, you dream about being warm. You know, that's... That's what you dream about, you know, like, you dream about, like, uh, eating, you know, like, I had sleep for dinner tonight. It's okay. It's okay, buddy. We got a home now. Housing First may well have saved Ezra's life. Maybe it's the way forward. Give a person a place to live, perhaps the rest will follow. Nick Purden, CBC News, Edmonton. Up next, a mystery on display that's just begging to be solved. Whomever it's by, we can tell from the quality of the painting itself that it's a really stunning portrait. No one seems to know her story, but she's shedding light on the stories of others. Plus, it wasn't so much what Prince Harry said today that has people talking, but what was said right before he took the stage. All that right after the break. Prince Harry started the last round of his official engagements on a decidedly informal tone today. He's made it clear that we are all just to call him Harry. That was him being introduced at a tourism conference in the UK with a nod to his new life ahead. 
They do still have a number of official events to attend, but Harry and Meghan will be stepping back as senior members of the royal family on March 31st. The couple was here in Canada with their son Archie for much of this year. A painting on display at the Art Gallery of Ontario is a bit of a puzzle. It is a portrait of an elegant black woman and based on its style and material used, it was likely painted in the 1700s. But as Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains, that's about all that's known about it. Calm, confident, and resplendent in her silk dress and pearls, the lady holding an orange blossom holds court at the Art Gallery of Ontario. So whomever it's by, we can tell from the quality of the painting itself that it's a really stunning portrait. That's right, neither the artist nor the subject is known. We found the painting at an auction house in New York just a month ago. So the AGO is doing some detective work. In the building. Even so getting suggestions idea. from the public through a Facebook Live. But mystery aside, the portrait makes a powerful statement. By having white faces on our walls exclusively, we present a monolithic view of history that's just not accurate. The Art Gallery of Ontario is not the only arts institution trying to ensure that what's on its walls better reflects its visitors. At the Phillips Collection in Washington, a new exhibit looks at how black artists responded to Impressionism. But much of this curator's work has focused on white artists painting black people. We have slaves or descendants of slaves in Europe in various capacities, and they do end up at some point uh, in the artistic or in the visual record. But because of the lack of documentation, we often lose those histories, we often lose the stories. Adrian Child suspects finding the identity of the woman in the AGO painting won't be easy, but that her very presence is so important. And visitors seem to agree. It's a lovely painting, and uh, the girl has an interesting natural shyness to her. Coming from an unknown artist, so maybe you have uh, a lot of hidden history that we don't know about. For now, the woman with a mysterious smile will intrigue art lovers, no matter the color of her skin. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. The moment is next on The National, but first, we want to relive a moment in Canadian history. Again, can believe it, Friday will be 10 years since Team Canada won gold at the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. Do you remember where you were? Send us a quick video with your story to the national at cbc.ca or send it to us on Instagram at CBC the National. Planning something for Friday's show. Well, the winter blues might be hitting you hard right about now, especially if you're about to get slammed with all that snow coming our way. Now, in Toronto, the city's famed symphony orchestra thought it might have a cure, a surprise community concert free of charge. And their gift is our moment. We're having a free concert for the entire community. So we're calling it our Beat the Blues Winter Free Community Concert. We, uh, we had heard a couple of um, wonderful programs on uh, CBC Metro Morning about people calling in and saying, hey, you know, um, we want to talk about some good things that are going on in the world. And we thought, you know, what would be the way that we could help people create their own best moments in Toronto? People are coming out during a snowstorm, so we figure it might as well be fun music. Uh, I think this is great. I mean, it's a shame the weather may keep a few people away, but I love the fact that TSO is, uh, you know, having us out. We worked really hard with the musicians and the staff and figured out we were going to be able to put on a, a free show. So here we are. Well, what a great opportunity that would have been. And, and for anyone who's never been to a production sort of of that scale, you feel the music in your bones when you're, you feel it rattle your, your rib cage. It's really something. Especially at Roy Thompson Hall. Yeah. Uh, they've never done this before, mm. and so they, they said, well, how are we going to ticket this? So they, they put the tickets online, and within four hours, they were gone. All gone. Good success. Oh. So that is a national for February 26th. Good night. Good night.